Uh, what's, what is next here? Well, let's, uh, now we have a song of a little bit more substance. Okay. Uh, it's a McCartney... You know, I was thinking about... Well, well we're going to get to that song sooner or later on the White Album, but Savoy Truffle by George Harrison. Uh, both of his songs on that record, I, or maybe he has a few more, I forget. Oh, yeah, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Right. Uh, you notice how moralistic he is. I look at the world, I notice it's turning, but my guitar cries for the world. Like, mm -hmm. You know, again, that moralistic stance of, oh, the world's so screwed up, but I know. I know. Yeah. Uh, and then he has, uh, what did we do the other day? Um, uh, piggies, you know. Oh, capitalists, they're evil, right? Uh, he was always going off on morality, uh, and he was actually very money-oriented of the, all the Beatles. He was really counting the cash. That's why he wrote Taxman. He realized just how much they were being ripped off. Oh. Um, and Savoy Truffle is just a list of desserts, and he's making this metaphor of, oh, you're going to lose your teeth if you eat this, and, and the, when you go to the dentist, it's really going to be painful. But why would he write a song about that? Now, some people say it's because his buddy Eric Clapton was into chocolate, and uh, hmm. they once had a conversation about it. He told Clapton, look, man, you know, keep eating that chocolate, you're going to lose your teeth. Um, but I think there's more to the metaphor than that. I, he's talking about insipid sweetness, overindulging in insipid sweetness. And frankly, my honest feeling is he was talking covertly about Paul McCartney. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's my take. Because those were the days when the Beatles started. They were so... Uh, after Peppers was done and they had that big rush of inspiration, uh, right after that they were all kind of disillusioned. And they really didn't want to make another record, and they came up with Magical Mystery Tour, which is kind of a throw-off. Mm -hmm. um, White Album comes along, and they're getting tired of each other. They're really getting tired. They're starting to see each other's personalities now. They're, like, living together. Well, and what together. fame and money has done and all that sort of thing, uh, yeah. Yeah, and not to forget, some. too, McCartney's ego had begun to develop as a musician by uh, Eleanor Rigby and the Revolver record. So he, his ego was growing and growing and growing by the time he got to White Album. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, in the sense that the Beatles were spoiled, I always say, and they could get away with anything. McCartney had his own little mini miniature version of that inside his own head that he, Paul McCartney, could do anything because he was the genius of the Beatles. Okay, that's where I felt he was coming from, and that's why I think the Beatles began to get more and more aggressive against him. If you watch the movie Let It Be, it's really sad to watch the whole thing. Huh? Len is just mocking the hell out of. McCartney. Oh. And McCartney is writing these little subtle digs into songs like uh, "Get Back." You know. Well, it's curious. It's also curious just what the title is, uh, because it it does have a very upper crusty, you know, delicate. Say so if you know what those things are mm -hmm. and and uh, and how they're presented, and they they cost money. Right. Uh, it's not uh, like Princess Di's favorite uh, candy was. was uh, what was it? It was the British equivalent of M and M's. But they're better. But they're um, but they're still they're just everyday candy. Right, right, you know? right. Uh, but Savoy Truffle. Well, yeah. that's a different ball game. Somebody's putting on the right, dog. Right, 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 you know? right, right. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the desserts he lists are actually very ritzy. Desserts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know the song. And we'll, we'll hit it, you know, in the near future. Yeah. Right now, the next song that has any substance at all to it, but still. I don't know if I would put this on, on the record, frankly. This is I Will by jo Paul McCartney, and probably a lot of chicks out there will get pissed at me for saying this because they just love the song. Yeah. Um, but Very melodic. It's melodic, and it's the basis from which people like Gilbert O'Sullivan and Emmett Rhodes and all these guys ah. get the This was the, the model. Oh, that makes this sense. This was, and this is what makes me, you know, it's like I always talk about how much I hate the 70s music, mm. and... Uh, one of the things I point the finger at is nice guy music. You know, I, I resent the fact that I was brought up to be kind of emasculated, uh, you know, with women's lib and everything. You're supposed to be a sensitive guy. But the fact of the matter is, you know, women didn't find that attractive. You know, yeah. that was just some sort of media thing. Oh, okay. Um, so the, all this nice guy music comes up, you know. Uh, and not to denigrate these artists, but I, in fact, uh, James Taylor, you know, wonderful musician, but he had his nice guy songs. Oh, yeah. You know? uh, John Denver, nice guy songs galore. Jim Croce, oh, 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of people like Jim Croce, so sorry, but he just... Uh, Cat Stevens, another one, made me puke. See, but I'm going to argue me. with you on that. Cause I, I know a lot of people. <laughs> I have a good buddy who's an advanced sax player, and man, he... We talked about Cat oh, yeah. Stevens. He loves Cat Stevens. I guess <laughs> bad Cat Stevens. Because <laughs> it was all this, like, I don't know, there was this whole run of musicians that was coming out with these kind of self-reflective uh, self songs about relationships yeah. with people and lovers and all this. And it was like, oh, my God, here we go again. I thought Dylan got rid of this stuff. You know, but only Bob Dylan could write a, a love song and make it incredibly poignant. It's really hard to write a love song. It's really hard to write a love song. That's one of the hardest things. Yeah, it's been so worked over for so long because <laughs> a, a number of songs, you, know, you ask them, you know, what do you write songs about? You have to write about love, you know, <laughs> and, right. and the, the intricacies and the right, sure. you know, all the problems with it. And, uh, it's an age-old tradition. Yeah. You know? Uh, and uh, but uh, for instance, there's a, a really terrific young songwriter, uh, Josh Ritter. He's originally out of Idaho. I think he's all of about 30 now, something like that. And they, in interviews, they'll ask him. He says, "You know, all that interior stuff. Everybody else writes about that. All that you know, lovey gooey, you know, and, and the confessional stuff." Right, right, right. He said, "I have got kingdoms of imagination in my head." Uh, that put together other things. He will write about historical events that most people don't know about, but he'll bring them to life, that sort of thing. He has all sorts of, you know, a great, great song, I Got a Girl in the War. A guy, a father talking mm -hmm. about, or a guy mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about his girl over in Afghanistan, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but he just, he leaves all that other, that saccharine stuff and that, that uh, incredibly internally reflective stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, other, you know, there's enough of that. <laughs> so. I think some of the more advanced folk artists can get away with love songs and make them substantial. Leonard Cohen's another one. He could write just incredibly beautiful love songs, and they have so much spiritual depth. You know, mm -hmm. there's wisdom in his music, you know. Well, he was first and foremost a poet, so yeah, he comes yeah. at things from that. Same with Dylan, in a way. I mean, he's really a poet, mm -hmm. you know. Not, you don't ask Joni Mitchell about that. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they locked heads. Oh. They locked horns quite a few times. Joni yeah. and, and Dylan could not be in the same room together. He's got, a, he's got a fake name. He sings with a fake voice. And he has a fake, he has, he's a fake personality. <laughs> she, just, she just has no time for him, yeah. Well, personally, I think Joni was, was that generation's sting, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, Sting was always, like, looking around for who he could play with that would change his sound, you mm -hmm. know. And Johnny was the same way. Look at me, I'm a jazz, I'm, I'm hanging out yeah. with jazz. Mingus. Now. <laughs> yeah, Mingus. And, uh, you know, Sting with, his first, with all of his solo records, actually, you know, pretty much, he was playing with really advanced jazz musicians. Yeah. You know, which is a good thing, is a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really. Uh, I think Sting is a really, really great writer. I honestly do. I think he's a guy that, that writes about unusual stuff. He's very mm -hmm. literate, you know, and I like that. I, I enjoy that. And his approach to pop music it was completely different than anything I'd ever yeah. heard before. Yeah. And also he'd give his musicians like a lot of room to do what they do. A great example is St. Augustine in Hell from the Ten Summoners Tale. Real sleeper record, by the way. Yeah, like you've you like said that before. Favorite. I got it and downloaded it. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great. Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a But it's a, it's a different, it's, there's no question, it's a different thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's playing it on time signatures. and uh, St. Augustine, the hell I just love because, you know, you got Kenny Kirkland, uh, rest his soul, yeah. uh, playing, you know, when St. Augustine goes down to hell, he's playing all these whole tone scales, sound, like making uh, it sound like hell. Oh, really yeah. cool. Really cool. Anyway, I will. My theory here is yet again... Probably a capo on the first fret. It's an F, okay. and I highly doubt he wrote it an F. Uh, because of this lick, you can hear the open string ringing. Uh. Uh. <laughs> okay. All right, that, that's kind of hard. As you can see, it's kind of hard to do. If you do with the bar chord, it's even harder. You right. Know? So I highly doubt, um, you know, these guys were used to 
writing with chords like this, not bar chords. So I, I honestly believe uh, it was an E, and he moved it up a half step. Okay. So we're going to, for the time being, call it up just for the analysis. Um, when you're floating around on that sort of thing, does the vocal come in where it's like, you know, my voice is more comfortable up a half step? Is that, I mean, is, does that enter into uh, things? That, that or this sounds better, or the higher, this song sounds a little bit better with higher vocal pitch, whatever. I don't the other thing is this, though, you never know with the Beatles, especially from, like, Revolver on, because uh, George Martin was messing with speeding up tape a little bit to change the key sure. and slowing it down. So, you know, you could never tell. But n n n when you go to a higher key, you can hear a certain kind of uh, uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks effect okay. in the voice when you speed up the tape, even a, a semitone. You can, oh, okay. It's a little funny. Like in Strawberry Fields, they slow down the tape in the second verse. You can what? hear it. You know, they, like, what? Oh, there oh. were two halves that he put together? Was yeah. that the deal yeah. on that? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant work on George Martin. He performed a total miracle, and <laughs> partially with serendipity. But that song, you know, uh, Strawberry Fields was meant to be. It was a remarkable piece of music. Okay. Remarkable. And I think we analyzed that. Yeah. All right, so here we have a McCartney love song, very insipid, sappy. song. Really? One, okay. six, two, five. Okay. Then he changes it up. You know who I, I was just thinking of? It, you probably don't remember the TV show, but uh, you remember the artist, uh, the singer, Rick Nel or Ricky Nelson. Ricky Nelson, yeah, I remember. Sounds garden party and that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff, you know? That could easily have been done by Rick, Ricky so, Nelson. yeah. That's why I admire 70s artists like Steely Dan and Led Zeppelin, because they got away from trying to be the Beatles, oh. you know? Um, uh, and so did bands like the Eagles, except I just think the Eagles sucked. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, ladies and gentlemen. Send your cards and letters. <laughs> What's that scene in The Big Lebowski where he's in the taxi cab? And, uh, and there's some Eagles song on, and, and like Lebowski in the back seat says, Man, the Eagles? <laughs> <laughs> you might as well put the Carpenters on. <laughs> I don't know what it is about the Eagles. I guess the first half of them was completely insipid with, with all their faux sensitive guy country music. And then when Joe Walsh came in and started to like inflict this kind of like cynical, moral, you know, moralizing the way Harrison used to do, life in the fast lane, talking about, you know, coke use and all that. What pot kettle black here, dude? Yeah. You know? I mean, come on. Well, you know. Well, he's in the slower lane now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, uh, was it the 70s that was referred to as the me generation or the 60s? I think 70s. It was the 70s, right? Yeah. Yeah. And as a response to the 60s. I think the smiley face, the happy face says it all right there. That's, yeah. You know. I got the t-shirt. All right. So that's uh, <laughs> I will. So what we have is a one, six, again in our template. One, two, three, four, 
four, five, six. So we have a one, six, two, five, which is your 50s music again. Okay. Right, right? Except he changes it up. So he goes... And this is actually nice. Right? And then, as if that's not enough, he gives us the five, seven, a four chord, which really adds a real nice little movement. Um, so again... to the four chord. Okay. So this is four. So we have one, six, two, five. One, six, three. Okay. Five, seven, a four. Four, five, six, four, five, one. Okay. Um, all right, so I will. Uh, now, so we have that progression again. One, six, two, five. One, six, three, five, seven, a four, four, five, six, four, five, one. Now another artifice that songwriters use, and this is a, a very it's used a lot in country and in and, and blues, um, where you've done everything you can do in the one where one is the root. And now you temporarily modulate to the four chord, which in the key of F is B flat. So here we have, in I will, we have that. Now we get, 50s music does this, I, that's what I was thinking. Of. So we're, we're placing emphasis on the four chord. to the four. Five, seven, and five. Okay. All right, and here's our five. All right, so that's that's really, that's that's the essence of the song, you know. Nice flow to it. Yeah, no, it's a, low, it's a sweet little piece of music. Yeah. Um, again, part of the self-indulgence I see is like you have a song like this where the Beatles are not involved. It's just McCartney on a mic and a guitar, or whatever. Uh, let's well, actually, let's listen. I, I'm not sure what the production is like on this one. Right. I heard Ringo was banging on some bongos or paint buckets or something. But there are no other Beatles in this. Maybe, maybe Harrison did it. Yeah. But I doubt it, because McCartney... That's done on a 12-string guitar. And then you look at Blackbird. Again, it's his foot tap and his guitar and his voice, and that's it. All right, so... There's the self-indulgence again. It's like he's not inviting the other Beatles to play. He feels this song is, is almost like too... Maybe... It was too much... It's too much me. Okay. The, the Beatles involved, you know. Man. Um, oh, I see what this little bar thing is. It really is the zoom. Oh, the zoomer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to put an end to things today. Yeah. Uh, we've, uh, because of the unsophistication of some, or these are my words, of some of the tunes, we've uh, taken all sorts of little musical detours, but they've been kind of fun. So uh, we sign off until two weeks from okay. now. Bye. Cool.